Hello. Mm. Here we go. That's it. <laughs> Good evening. Um, <laughs> and to you. Thank you very, very much for turning out. I know there's not much going on at the moment. Um, <laughs> you've all got very little to do. Um, uh, there is a big elephant in the room, obviously. It's quite a big day. Um, uh, a friend of mine went to bed early, got up. Boris said he'd got an enormous majority. She thought, well, he's lying, so it's been quite a good day. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> this won't be a strictly topical show. We're bringing the annual to the stage. So we're looking back over the year. Um, and uh, so we will start. Private Eye, we have um, a, a sort of forum for questions of our own. Um, the Prime Minister doesn't like answering questions very much um, from anyone, but we do have a very specific column. And we have asked him um, the most um, important question facing him today, which is, what exactly, Prime Minister, was your relationship with the entrepreneur, <laughs> tech guru and pole dancer, <laughs> Jennifer Arcuri? <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I, I've made it a policy uh, not to answer questions about my private life. <laughs> Even when it's not about my private life. Uh, it's about me giving people money for services rendered. Uh, not that any services of that nature were uh, rendered uh, digitally or otherwise in this case. <coughs> it was all about showing me how to find a hotspot and how to turn my device on and off. Well, mostly on. And that's all my regular afternoon visits to her flat were about. Uh, simple matters of a floppy disk or a hard drive. <laughs> Fwa. Uh, perfectly normal, may oral sex. Uh, I mean business. Fuck business. No, no, not about that. No. It was perfectly innocent. I offered her a trade missionary position. Yeah. Oh, I seem to be tying myself up in knots. Uh, or was that somebody else? Yeah, uh, 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 <laughs> I know nothing about this whatsoever. Miss Arcuri says that I said uh, I don't like women anymore, except the Queen, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lewis. Hey. Now, it, it's been a tough year financially for everyone. Um, uh, austerity obviously ended. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this year we've been sponsored by the um, No Mark Christmas Royal Gift Department, um, and we, we I'm sorry we've got to present a series of adverts for the the luxury gifts that they want to sell you this Christmas. The Andy Perspirant. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry, it's me. <laughs> Say goodbye to unwanted disco floor sweating misery with this amazing Andy Please. Perspirant from Pedo Links for Men. <clears throat> Clammy palms and damp armpits are a thing of the past for you, if not your PR people. Perfect for Tramp nightclub, news night interviews and awkward audiences with your mother. Price, your job. <coughs> Choice of odours, stinky, fishy, <laughs> whiffy. <laughs> the Christmas non-sweater. Made from the wooliest of woolly excuses, <laughs> navy surplus, as worn by helicopter personnel in the Falklands when serving queen and country. The non-sweater works even under fire. Extremely thick. <laughs> Colours, blood blue. Face red, goose green. <laughs> Price, £250,000 per annum from Civil List. The straightforward shooting stick. <laughs> Perfect for every straightforward shooting weekend. Are you and your slightly creepy plus one going to a dodgy <laughs> event that may involve money and favours? Then don't forget your straightforward shooting stick, TN. When you haven't a leg to stand on, simply open it up and hey presto! You're having a right royal time and no questions asked. Well, not yet, anyway. <laughs> Price, a straightforward £15,000 loan to your wife. 
Warning, sit on correct end to avoid pain in bottom. <laughs> <laughs> the Woking Pizza Wheel. <laughs> Never eaten pizza before? Unsure how to divide a circular dough-based snack into slices <laughs> at your daughter's friend's party many miles from the nearest nightclub. <laughs> then you need the Woking Pizza Wheel. <laughs> a fully Woking Pizza Wheel. <laughs> which stylishly segments as it travels effortlessly across the tomato and mozzarella <laughs> surface. Price, 13 million pounds or nearest Verbier Chalet. Warning, wheel may fall off, pizza wheel. <laughs> Everything must go, including Prince Andrew. <laughs> hurry, hurry, while the monarchy lasts. <coughs> <laughs> Not... Thank you. <laughs> That's the first time we've used props. I think it's been a huge success. <laughs> 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 With one notable exception. <laughs> <laughs> Not very bright. <laughs> now, it wasn't a great year uh, for the royal family, um, but it wasn't a great year for the former prime minister. And in, in looking back, um, I have to record, Private Eye had the final resignation letter from Theresa May. It is with great sadness <laughs> that I accept the resignation of yet another senior member of my cabinet. Myself. <laughs> I have tried to talk myself out of it, but in the end, it's a matter of principle. I would like to thank myself for my selfless and unwavering dedication to the country and for sticking with me through the good times, the first five minutes, <laughs> and the bad, the rest. I would also like to congratulate myself on the myriad achievements of my tenure. Perhaps I should list them. No, there are too many to go into, <laughs> and uh, we just don't have time. Suffice to say that I am proud of my record as the second female Prime Minister, not the first, not the last, and possibly not even the best, <laughs> but certainly in the top two. <laughs> as I write this, I can't help recalling the wise words of my husband, Philip, speaking one minute ago, who said... Darling, I think you should give it a rest and start packing. <laughs> but I wanted to pay tribute to the wonderfully disloyal colleagues who I've been so lucky to disagree with. Can I start with Mr Johnson? I can again quote my wise husband, Phil. Come on, darling. Those leather trousers won't pack themselves. <laughs> So I shall resist the temptation to call Boris a loathsome, untrustworthy, immoral, self-seeking, over-ambitious, egotistical, two-faced Judas. <laughs> <laughs> As Philip has just said... Darling, that really is enough. If you don't stop writing, I'll have to put this letter in the bin and take it out. <laughs> yes, this is an emotional moment for you. I've no doubt that many of you have tears in your eyes. <laughs> but this is no time for rancour. That will be next week, when my job will be taken over by the biggest <laughs> rancour of them all. <laughs> Jan Raymonds! Um, at Private Eye, we run a popu <laughs> popular column of real questions which real people have given um, on quiz shows. Uh, it's called Dumb Britain, and these are all genuine answers that contestants gave on shows like The Chase, The Tipping Point, Mastermind, Tenable, Pointless, and many more. So, for the purposes of this evening, our uh, quiz master will be Bradley Walsh, and these are all genuine. Who rode a horse while naked through the streets of Coventry? The Queen. <laughs> Regent's Canal is a branch of which canal? The Suez Canal. <laughs> the idea of veganuary encourages people to eat a vegan diet in which month? October. <laughs> in 1649, which English war resulted in the beheading of King Charles I? World War I. <laughs> in which European country was Deutsche Bank founded? France. 
the meat from which bird is traditionally included in the Scottish soup, cockaliki? Lamb. <laughs> <laughs> How were Tinky Winky, Dipsy, Lala and Poe collectively known? The Marx Brothers. <laughs> was the first man in space? Lance Armstrong. <laughs> <laughs> Name a North American deer beginning with C. Camel. <laughs> in Othello, who kills Desdemona? Macbeth. <laughs> <laughs> Who designed St Paul's Cathedral in London? St Paul. <laughs> <laughs> in Life on Mars, David Bowie wonders if there was life on which planet? <laughs> Jupiter. <laughs> <laughs> Keir Hardy was the first leader of which British political party? UKIP. <laughs> Which Italian composed the score for eight of Sergio Leone's films? Vivaldi. <laughs> what two-word place name is the location of the Ministry of Defence's military scientific research station? Strawberry Fields. <laughs> Emma Hamilton was the mistress of which naval hero? Popeye. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to Marcus Berkman, who compiles those every issue. <laughs> it's not all down market to private eye. We have our own poet, E.J. Thrib, who's a lyric threnodist. He tends to write a people about people's deaths, and um, we've got a series of his works this evening. We're going to start with um, uh, his poem on the death of Nicky Lauda. This is In Memoriam, Nicky Lauda. So farewell, then, Nicky Lauda, racing driver, survivor, and global ambassador, but above all, the world's favourite playground joke. Who was the 1975 Formula One world champion? Lauda. I said, who was the 1975 <laughs> Formula One world champion? <laughs> the old ones are the best ones. <laughs> and in your case, that was true. <laughs> Thank you very much, Harry. Still up, we do try and interview people, and one of the ways we do it is we run a, a column called Me and My Spoon, um, which is a sort of celebrity interview, a way of getting uh, relatable interviews with people who wouldn't normally give them. And we were very lucky, we got Kirsty Wark to interview Dominic Cummings, um, the Prime Minister's spin doctor. Noto notoriously difficult to interview. Um, and this was the big Me and My Spoon interview. Mr. Cummings, do you have a favourite spoon? Dumb question. Next. Are there any spoons you find help you de-stress after a long day at work? Oh, what a waste of time this is. Ask another one, you stupid fuck. <laughs> is there a kind of spoon you find especially collectible? No, move on. Just fucking get on with it. <laughs> what was your first <laughs> encounter with spoons? Not relevant. I'm a hard man, not a spoon twat. But you asked us for this interview. Shut up! You want to waste my time, you want to betray my trust, there's the fucking door. <laughs> Do you like anything spoon-related at all? I'll beat you up with a spoon <laughs> in a second. Why? Because I'm a maverick and I don't give a shit. Has anything amusing ever happened to you with... Fuck off! <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> A sophisticated guide to British politics. Um, we also try and cover American politics. And if you remember, early in, in this year, President Trump went on record and was rather dismissive of the part that the Kurds had played during the recent wars in the Middle East. And to back up his argument, he produced his own definitive version of the great battles of history. And we're very privileged to print that version. Normandy, World War II. 
The Allied invasion <laughs> of Western Europe. Western Europe. <laughs> was launched on June the 6th, 1944. <laughs> and the U.S. forces from the combined Saving Private Ryan battalions <laughs> stormed the beaches of France with the help of British and Canadian troops, but with no help from those cowardly losers, the Kurds. <laughs> Fact. Custer's Last Stand. Custer's Last Stand, or the Battle of the Little Bigly Horn. <laughs> On the 25th of June, 1876, was a fierce battle between the Lakota, Northern Porsche Cayenne, and the Al Pacino tribes, <laughs> and the 7th Cavalry Regiment of the United States, where General Custer's defeat <laughs> is blamed by all historians on the cowardly Kurds, <laughs> not killing all the scary Red Indians or native Armenians, <laughs> as they were known at that time. Fact. The Alamo. You know, the Battle of the Alamo in February 1836 was a 13-day siege when Mexican troops, not great. <laughs> <laughs> Under President Old El Paso. <laughs> Mostly drug dealers and rapists, you know. <laughs> they overran the American fort manned by Davy Crockett and John Wayne. The Infinity War. The Infinity War of 2017. <laughs> so half the Earth's population wiped out, wiped out, as a direct result of the cowardly Kurds refusing to put on Lycra and fight alongside Iron Man, Captain America, and the Black Widow. Fact. Ladies and gentlemen, Lewis. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just Trump. We try and keep abreast of um, world events. Uh, the collapse of the Venezuelan government, despite uh, widespread support in Britain, uh, prompted... <laughs> prompted a very, very big to-do <coughs> in the media, mm. and uh, there was a letter to The Guardian complaining about The Guardian, um, and it was written by Ken Livingstone, former mayor of London, an expert on interwar Zionism in Germany, um, <laughs> co-signed by about 137 others, but making a genuine and important point about Venezuela and Britain and The Guardian. May we, the undersigned, <laughs> express our total and utter disgust at the totally sickening and utterly predictable stance taken by the so-called Guardian newspaper with regard to the entirely legitimate and utterly blameless Marxist, Leninist, Chavisist, Magyarist government of Venezuela, which is being cynically undermined by reactionary Trumpist, Blairist, neoliberals in the media, like the hated Guardian, who are acting merely as the useful idiots and friendly running dogs of the fascist, imperialist, interventionist, military, industrial complex led by the hated US, who are totally and utterly and sickeningly responsible for the entire made-up Venezuelan crisis, which has been orchestrated merely to discredit Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> <laughs> Yours sincerely, Ken Livingston, John Landsman, Dave Spart, Adolf Hitler, <laughs> ad nauseum. <laughs> <laughs> We don't just reproduce other people's letters, we try and offer a public service at Private Eye, and we run a notes and queries column in which members of the public are allowed to ask us what a word or a phrase means that has come into um, common parlance. And uh, this extract, the question that was vexing our readers is who or what is Huawei? <laughs> Huawei is a traditional shout of encouragement in the northeast of England. 
<laughs> as in how were we the lads? <laughs> or nowadays, I expect we have to say how were we the lasses? <laughs> Sunderland FC, and no doubt Sunderland Ladies FC, have adopted this as their official slogan. For any Southerners reading, it roughly translates in a received pronunciation as, you shall have a fishy on a little dishy. You shall have a fishy when this hand's closed down. <laughs> 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 that was from the Reverend Geordie Gregg's Vegan Roll, um, <laughs> writing from Tyne and Hawawea. Uh, but an <laughs> thank you. Another reader disagreed. I'm afraid the good Reverend is Huawei with the fairies on this one. Huawei is the Pacific Island that was the location for the long-running US police and surfing procedural TV drama Huawei 50. <laughs> Starring Steve McGarrett as Book Him Dan O'Dyer. <laughs> Guest stars included the young Judy Dench, who played McGarrett's girlfriend and can be seen in the canoe, third paddler from the left in the title sequence, featuring the famous theme music by Piers Moronioni. <laughs> That's the Honourable Lulu Grasskirt from Honolulu, but fortunately a third reader put them right. Aloha, pedants. <laughs> You've got this one completely wrong. Huawei, pronounced who are we, is a giant Chinese communication firm that produces mobile phones technology. They originally got their name from a long running joke which went as follows Knock, knock, who's there? Huawei, we're the Chinese government masquerading as a commercial firm in order to spy on the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> the humor is possibly lost in translation from the original Mandarin, but Chinese friends assure me that it's a very funny joke. But best not told in the presence of any Chinese authority figure, or indeed any Huawei handset. <laughs> <laughs> that was from the artist I Huawei. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you really must read this script sometime. <laughs> um, so, thank yeah. you for that. Time for some more poetry. Um, and this was um, uh, our threnodist again on the retirement of John Humphreys. So this is lines on the retirement of John Humphreys from Radio 4's The Today programme. So, farewell then, John Humphreys. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to stop you there. <laughs> We've run out of time. Yes, that was your catchphrase. And now we can all say it to you. <laughs> Lewis again, thank you. <laughs> uh, now, uh, um, it's time to go back to the royal family, who we don't just cover with adverts. We have our own um, romantic novelist, Sylvie Crin, um, who writes about the trials and tribulations, largely about Prince Charles. Um, it's called Heir of Sorrows. And in this episode, the royal family are gathered for an important weekend at Sandringham. Charles wandered down the ornate corridors of the great Jacobethan country house, where the sound of voices reached him from behind the oak-panelled door of the Cannon and Ballroom. <laughs> Charles pressed his royal ear against the ancient timber. It's Mater, and she's making an important announcement. Without me, it really is. But there was no time to be appalled. <laughs> Philip, one has reached a decision. There does come a time when one has to face the reality of time passing and admit that one is simply not as young as one once was. There was an interjection from Prince Philip which sounded a bit like a cough but could have been a single word. Rollocks. <laughs> Perhaps it was nautical slang from the Duke's time in the Navy as captain of HMS Irascible. <laughs> I shall ignore that, continued the monarch. What one is saying is that at a certain point, one has to stop. 
one has to take a back seat and let a younger person take the controls. There was a murmur of assent from what Charles suddenly realised was the entire Windsor family gathered for this historic announcement. First came the voice of Prince William. Top thinking, g -ma. <laughs> Said the second in line to the throne. His loyal wife, Princess Kate Middleclass, agreed. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> then came the unmistakable Californian tones of Meghan Markle, the Duchess of Sparkle. Yeah, like, I think that's so, you know, wise and thoughtful and cool, and maybe we should all, like, have a group hug. <laughs> Prince Harry, Duke of Hazard, and Meghan's official consort <laughs> added... <coughs> Megs is totes right. I mean, she's a balls. <laughs> Charles could not believe his ears and thought to himself, Is this why I've been excluded from the gathering? Because it's my moment in history, my hour of destiny thingy. So that's it. It's decided. I shall make a royal decree and the retirement will be official. There was a loud crash as Charles burst through the door, sending the Ming Campbell vase tumbling onto the marble floor. <laughs> as he shouted at his bewildered family, Viva myself, Rex Futurus, Rex Harrison. <laughs> The third Carolingian age is upon us. God save me. What the bloody hell are you talking about, boy? Growled Charles's father. Your father is giving up driving. He's handing in his licence. <laughs> Explained Her Majesty the Queen patiently. Grandpops has got to stop, Peter. Added Prince William. At a junction, before he hits anyone else. <laughs> added Prince Harry mischievously. The royal family all fell about laughing at this sally of Harry's hirsute humour, the bonhomie reducing them to fits of giggles at the thought of a member of the public being run over by the Duke's get-off-my-land rover. <laughs> <laughs> Charles left the room quietly and closed the door as the chill Norfolk wind whistled down the corridor in all too familiar mockery. <laughs> to be continued. <laughs> <coughs> We try and follow um, the career of proper actors um, uh, throughout the year, and this year we offered a guide, because there are a lot of award ceremonies, and uh, the Oscar ceremony, again, is very confusing. And this is a simple guide to help you spot which nationality an actor is when they win an Oscar. This is an American winning an Oscar. I was put on this earth. with a God-given talent which would propel me to greatness my whole life has been built towards this moment when I could share my genius with a grateful world I love that you all love me look at me ma Top of the world! <laughs> and this is a British actor winning an Oscar. Oh, gee, golly gun drops. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, blimey. Bit pissed, actually. Uh, anyway, uh, call blimey. All right, sir, this is a mistake. Uh, all right, the old China gives a snog. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> sorry. Uh, no, this... Oh, Glenn Close. Um, uh, no, it must be a mistake. Sorry. Uh, rhubarb and custard, not down ginger. Uh, uh, put a brew on. Um, Toodle pip. Oh, fuck. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, goodness me, Mother, I've come over all peculiar. <laughs> Jan Raven. <laughs> <laughs> um, and now it's time for um, a contribution from Craig Brown, who writes a lot of diaries for us. Um, uh, he couldn't sadly be here tonight, but he has left us with the diary of Jacob Rees-Mogg. Um, <laughs> and in this diary, Jacob describes a traditional English breakfast at his home. Nanny delivers two hearty thumps with a teaspoon to my boiled eggs and sets about unpeeling them. It's high time you learnt to do this by yourself, Master Jacob. She says, oh, Nanny, I reply. 
perusing the Financial Times. Do not berate me so, for my mind is at present filled with the more pressing concerns of Queen and country. Oh, you're so sharp, you'll cut yourself. Chuckles Nanny. Elbows off the table, Master Jacob. Nanny draws up a chair and takes her knife to the toast. She butters it, then cuts each slice up into lovely straight lines. The soldiers have arrived, <laughs> Master Jacob, and they're queuing up for their dipping. With that, she dips my first soldier into the yolk. This is a sign for me to open my mouth as wide as I possibly can. Any pop? Says Nanny, placing it in my mouth. What a good boy! Mmm, I exclaimed. I noticed the chairs in Consolidated are down a couple of points, <laughs> though no cause for immediate concern. Open wide and down the big red road. Oh, you're all finished. That is a good boy. I take up my napkin and wipe my own mouth. I am, I need hardly say, a firm believer in self-reliance. Let's be getting you dressed, Master Jacob. <laughs> says Nanny. Time you were out of those gym jams. Together we climb the stairs to my dressing room. Skinner rabbit! Says Nanny, pulling out my gym jam tops. She lets me take my bottoms off myself. Right then, let's get you on the bed and we'll see to you. Says Nanny. I dutifully lie on the bed for Nanny to unpin my towering nappy. <laughs> I put legs high in the air. This makes it so much easier for Nanny to give things a really good wipe down there. <laughs> These ancient traditions, dating back generations, are at the very heart of the rees mogg family. Oh, who's been a messy boy then? <laughs> laughs Nanny. I leaf through the latest issue of The Spectator. It's as well to keep in touch with, touch with what ordinary decent people are thinking. And a period of silence, for me, helps Nanny get on with the job in hand. Oh, lovely and clean. This country must learn to grow up and stand <laughs> on its own two feet. And it's important to set an example. Ladies and gentlemen, Jacob rees -Mogg. Uh We're now uh, halfway through the show, and I realise many of you won't have had a chance to look at your phones. So, uh, in order to help you out, here's what you've missed on Mail Online. Hilarious moment as Cheeky Mouse is flattened by Garden Roller. Video. 2015 X Factor winner, Jack Scrubs, praised as very down-to-earth for eating a Twix on public transport. <laughs> Pussycat Doll leaves little to the imagination as she displays her very impressive physique in stylish bikini while showcasing new yoga moves on beach in Dubai. Whoops, tourist 20, dives from cliff straight onto the rocks, breaks neck, video. <laughs> Carol Vorderman flaunts toned physique as she walks to shops, buys pint of milk and jar of marmalade. Hilarious moment, man dressed as Santa falls off ladder and breaks leg in six places, video. Fears grow that former sex symbol Kim Basinger is now 30 years older than she was in 1989. <laughs> Mary Berry buys attractive new shower curtain from John Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> Viewers spot Susanna Reid asking for a second glass of water on Good Morning Britain. I felt a little bit thirsty, explains top presenter. <clears throat> Squirrel drops nut, picks it up, drops it again. <laughs> Video. <laughs> Swimsuit model, 24, shows off her curves in tight white sweater whilst being tragically savaged by runaway bull. <laughs> Video. <laughs> Katy Perry, naked. Beneath three layers of clothing. <laughs> 
buttock implants explode, sending woman 34 into space. <laughs> Video. Horrifying moment, child six bursts into tears on seeing face of Queen guitarist Brian May in Bakewell Tart. <laughs> Video. <laughs> Shopper finds live budgerigar in packet of Maltesers. <laughs> it's your Christmas tree planning to kill you while you're asleep. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Daily Mail online. Do keep going. <laughs> uh, time for another uh, poetic tribute. This is to John Burko. Uh, we now have lines on the retirement of Mr. John Burko from the Speaker's chair. So farewell then, John Burko. Oh, da! <laughs> oh, da! That was your catchphrase. <laughs> Except when it was, oh, da! will miss hearing your voice, but not as much as you will. <laughs> <laughs> you are pompous, you are biased, and you were self-regarding. You also called Mrs. Ledsom a stupid woman. So you weren't always wrong. <laughs> <clears throat> Back to history, we try and keep up with historical developments at the eye, and we were delighted to find an original announcement from the captain of the Titanic. Yes, the captain of that very famous ship wrote um, a, a, a manuscript which we managed to get hold of, and it was called... Let's get the iceberg done. <laughs> <laughs> Some people have expressed concern about the fact that there is an iceberg in our path. But what I say to you is this. We have to get on with it. It's ahead of us. We're moving towards it. That's all there is to say on the matter. Anyone who thinks differently has to just get over it. And the great news is that the sooner we hit the iceberg, the sooner we'll be able to get on with attending to so many other things that need fixing on this ship. The sanatorium <laughs> needs to be cleaned out. The kitchens need to get on with preparing tomorrow's Brexit first. <laughs> the Irish below decks are being a bit boisterous. So to those of you who say, if we hit the iceberg, we might sink, I say no to Project Fear. Let's get the iceberg done. <laughs> <laughs> Time for sport. Uh, Private Eye also runs um, a column called Commentator Balls. It used to be Coleman Balls, but then all commentators started doing it. And these are all real gaffes um, made by sporting commentators. Uh, we start with football. Uh, this is Shout Brits on BBC Two. That's the big cherry on the carrot that I would like to grab. <laughs> <laughs> Ian Abrahams on Talk Sport. So was it a penalty? Not a penalty. Or neither. <laughs> Ray Parler, talk sport. And this is an isolated incident, but it's happening week in, week out. <laughs> Jackie Oatley on Radio 4. Lucy Bronze says she's ecstatic after becoming the first English player, male or female, to be named UEFA Women's Player of the Year. <laughs> Presenter on BT Sport. Said it needed to start like the proverbial train in Spain. <laughs> Stephen Gerrard, Radio 5 Live. This game can go either way. There's no two ways about it. <laughs> Chris Hooton on BBC One. Uh, uh, you don't become a bad team overnight. You have to wait for the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> a commentator hmm. on Radio Clyde. Yesterday's result is a gold star in his feather. <laughs> <laughs> Ian Holloway on TalkSport. This game can turn on a pendulum. <laughs> <laughs> Frank Lampard, BT Sport. Young players will always get into my side on merit. 
whether they deserve it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Roy Keane on ITV. The players have to be self-critical of themselves and each other. <laughs> <laughs> A commentator on Sky Sports. Just because something hasn't happened before doesn't mean it can't happen again. <laughs> And I should say, it's not just football, there was a lot of rugby this year. This was Michael Liner on ITV. Argentina took their gas off their toe in the <laughs> second half. <laughs> Brendan Mulligan on Radio 4. Plastic pictures do not benefit the grassroots. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie Hemmings on Sky Sports. Up he went like a salmon, one-handed. <laughs> <laughs> Cl <laughs> Clive Woodward on Radio 4. Eddie Jones is going full leather jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Commentator ITV. Going into the next game now with the wind under your belt. <laughs> <laughs> and Danny Buderus on Sky Sports. Cameron Munster always has that left foot up his sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> And we can't leave it without cricket, which somehow always manages to be the most filthy of all. This was David Gower on Sky Sports. Jofra Archer, one hand in a pocket, the other grabbing a ball. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this really was Stephen Lamb on BBC Radio Somerset. The Yorkshire captain elected not to have a toss this morning. And I think that's probably <laughs> quite enough of that. <laughs> Um, we've ducked politics quite long enough. I think it's now time um, to admit um, that uh, there was a lot of um, shenanigans um, in the year leading up to the election, and some people got a very hard time. And Diane Abbott has actually accused Question Time of deliberately inviting her onto the show in order to be ridiculed, and this is her response. Someone <laughs> deliberately tampered with my microphone. They turned it on. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning that everybody could actually hear what I was saying. <laughs> the BBC and Fiona Bruce clearly had an agenda to ensure that I'm not seen as a serious politician. First, by inviting me onto the show, and secondly, by allowing the general public to hear me defending Jeremy's Brexit strategy of not having one. <laughs> Other politicians may not have twigged what Question Time was up to, but I quickly put two and two together and got 3,659. <laughs> <laughs> Private Eye, we often run extracts from other newspapers, including historical newspapers, um, as a service to our readers. And this year, uh, we ran a piece from the Biblical Times, um, quite an old paper, um, and this was about climate change protest. The headline was, Climate Change Protest, Boat Annoys Everyone. A leading climate change activist, calling himself Noah, has parked a wooden boat in the middle of a busy Holy Land thoroughfare, <laughs> causing widespread disruption. The deliberate building of the so-called Ark and its placing at a known commercial junction has seriously inconvenienced shepherds, merchants and farmers trying to go about their business. But Noah and his followers, Ham, Shem, Japheth and Emma, son of Toms, are unrepentant. <laughs> the truth is said Noah, that man-made climate change <laughs> is about to engulf the Earth. The sea levels are going to rise by a large number of cubits, and most of the planet is going to drown. He continued, most animal species are going to be wiped out unless we do something right now. This is why my campaign is known as Extinction Rebellion. <laughs> Saving animals two by two may seem a small gesture, but it is vital we do something. Noah was immediately attacked by establishment critics 
who claimed there was no scientific evidence to support the theory that the world was about to be destroyed. Said what? This is just entitled middle-class whinging. Noah is well known as a rich, privileged patriarch who thinks he's got a hotline to God. She continued. It is typical that Noah should try to pin the blame on mankind for what he insists on calling <laughs> our sinful ways. A commentator from Cloudy Sky News accused Noah of hypocrisy for cutting down large numbers of trees to build his boat thus contributing directly to environmental damage. He should get a life, said Adam and Eve Bolton. <laughs> or better than that, get a job. Whatever Noah is claiming, there is absolutely nothing to... Hang on. Is, is that a drop of rain? I better get... <laughs> and we all know how that one ends. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the cast. It wouldn't be fair to have um, picked out previous Tory leaders without including John Major, um, who made quite a spirited intervention in this year's politics. Again, we have his secret diary. Uh, we're very lucky. And this is an extract from the secret diary of Sir John Major, aged 77 and three quarters. <laughs> Monday. It's an outrage, I said sounding not inconsiderably aggrieved and in no small measure furious. What's wrong, John? My wife Norman's hand hovered over this tea strainer. How dare a Prime Minister prorogue Parliament simply to escape scrutiny, I said. As I glared at her, my steely eyes framed by the finest frames spec savers had to offer. I'm sure people have forgiven you, John, for doing exactly that in 1997, before Sir Gordon Downey could deliver his report into cash for questions. She replied, as she reached to take my special Tony the Tiger breakfast cereal bowl out of the cupboard. <laughs> no, 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 Norman. That was completely different, I spluttered. I'm talking about that scoundrel Boris Johnson. When I did it, it was a perfectly reasonable use of parliamentary procedure. Whereas what Boris is doing is a flagrant attack on democracy, and it's time to do something about it. That's why you won't see much of me in the coming week, as I'll be with another woman. What did you say, John? Gina Miller and I will be spending our every waking minute preparing our case. I have to say that I've been immeasurably impressed by Gina's briefs. Yes, we are an unlikely pairing, but then they do say that politics makes for strange bedfellows. There was then a very loud sound of breaking crockery as Norman clumsily dropped my special bowl of cereal on my head, <laughs> making Tony the Tiger not inconsiderably extinct. Lewis MacLeod. It was the anniversary of D-Day this year, and again, we couldn't let that go uncovered. We had a special report from Hugh Edwards, um, which we reprinted in Private Eye. Uh, Hugh Edwards was looking solemn on a windswept beach, and overhead there was a fly-past of the Red Arrows and an easy jet flight to Mallorca. <laughs> Good evening, and welcome to our special D-Day coverage. We've now spoken to every living person who experienced the D-Day landings. So, with three hours of airtime still to fill, <laughs> we can now speak to everyone who didn't fly at D-Day, but think they did. <laughs> I'm joined by Marc Francois, MP, <laughs> wearing a fancy dress Salvation Army uniform he bought on eBay. <laughs> Hugh. I will never forget that moment when I came ashore, flanked on one side by Captain Mannering and on the other side by Private Pike, to a hail of gunfire from German snipers. Colonel Saunders died in my arms <laughs> on the beach that day, and his dying wish was that one day Britain would celebrate defeating the Germans for a second time by delivering Brexit and eating chlorinated chicken. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's our entire coverage. <laughs> 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 
Time for a quick poem. Uh, lines in celebration of the exhumation of the remains of the late General Franco. So, hello again, <laughs> General Franco. You are being dug up. Perhaps we should not be surprised to see you, as dictators are popping up everywhere <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jan. Um, on that basis, this is very late in the show, but it was quite late generally, so we're going to offer a quick apology um, on behalf of the Labour Party. Um, this will be appearing in all papers tomorrow. This is an apology for the apology we issued earlier for apologising too much over the accusations of anti-Semitism. We would like to say that we're very sorry for being sorry about being too sorry about the anti-Semitism and realise that this was, in fact, anti-anti-Semitism, <laughs> which was unacceptable from a party which is committed to anti-anti-anti-Semitism. <laughs> and honestly, you can't win with some people, <laughs> can you? No defence. No offence. <laughs> There's a late apology. <laughs> Time now for something more serious. Uh, Donald Trump, you know he came over for a state banquet with the Queen. Very few people know what he ate, but we have the menu in full. The Trump state banquet menu in full. To start... The Tiny Finger Buffet. <laughs> Grilled grape fruit, <laughs> dressed grab and octopusy, <laughs> clan chowder, <laughs> and for the main course, tweet and sour porky balls, <laughs> red Thai curry, Donald Duck a orange, not at all Russian salad, and for dessert, impeach Melba with Mexican walls <laughs> ice cream. <laughs> A selection of tarts. <laughs> <laughs> to drink. Fake booze. <laughs> Choice of alt-white and redneck vodka. Stormy Jack Daniels. <laughs> and to end with... Covefe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we do cover other broadcasting networks, particularly radio. We were very thrilled when Eddie Mayer went to LBC and produced a number of hard-hitting programmes. This one was about hands-free mobiles uh, for drivers. Um, Eddie Mayer, LBC. Right, listeners, our next topic is should hands-free mobiles be made illegal for drivers? I've got Ken on the line. Where are you, Ken? I'm on the, my, on, I'm on the A3. And what's your view, Ken? Oh, well, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, it's just a nanny state. It's political correctness gone mad. I mean, there's nothing dangerous about using your mobile in the car while you drive, so long as you concentrate and don't get distracted by the conversation that you're... Oh, fuck it out! Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm afraid we seem to have lost Ken there. Thanks for that. <laughs> Got another caller. Hello, Julie. Hi, Eddie! And where are you calling from? The far I didn't know there was a fast lane on the M25. <laughs> 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 oh. I'm afraid we seem to have lost Julie as well. Not having much luck today, are we? Can we have a caller from home, maybe? Ah, Simon, where are you? Well, I'm safe and sound on the sofa in my front room at the home, uh, which is on a bend on the A262. <laughs> yes, I know it well, the sharp bend. That's right, Eddie. As a libertarian, I think people should be allowed to make their own minds up. Like this bloke I can see out of the window. <laughs> He's on the phone. He's driving his articulated lorry perfectly safely <laughs> through my front window. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Thanks for that. And now over to Nigel Farage for another car crash. <laughs> Eddie Mayer on radio. Mm. 
Uh, talking of Farage, just time for a diary, courtesy of Craig Brown again, from Anne Widdicombe. Um, you, you noticed she was third the other night, um, very sadly. Anyway, this is her diary, uh, uh, exclusive to Private Eye. Ever since we first joined the European Union, British life has been going steadily downhill. For example, dog's mess on the pavement. The war generation went through hell, came back, and were expected just to get on with it. But when the younger generation see a dog's mess in the street, they come over all queasy and reach for the smelling salts. In fact, there's a lot you can do with a dog's mess. Left in the deep freeze overnight, then painted in nice bright blues and reds, a dog's mess makes a delightfully cheery table decoration. <laughs> or save money by using it as putty or blue tack to stick up to-do lists in your kitchen or bathroom. But the snowflake generation simply can't be bothered with practical matters, no. They much prefer to bleat and whine, talk about weedy little good-for-nothings. Heaven help us! Thank you to Anne Whittacombe. <laughs> um, this is a last poem. Um, in memoriam, Lady Marcia Faulkender. She was the private and political secretary to Harold Wilson. I'm going to read this one myself. So, farewell then, Lady Faulkender. You were famous for allegedly having an affair with Labour Prime Minister Harold Wilson and drawing up his infamous lavender list. You were also very litigious on those two points. <laughs> but now you are dead. And can no longer sue. <laughs> so we will be dropping the allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> Just time, I'm afraid, uh, for a letter to the Daily Telegraph, which I'm afraid uh, we have uh, taken and reproduced. It's from Sir Herbert Gusset. Um, and he writes um, on the subject of England's victory in the Cricket World Cup. Um, uh, he gives his address um, as uh, Silly Mid on Avon. Um, I think, uh, is, Sir John, uh, is he with us, Sir yeah. Herbert? Yes, thank you. And uh, we, we all have to leave the theatre sometime later. Uh, so, yeah. Sir Herbert Gusset. Sir, <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only one to take strong exception to the chorus of approval which has greeted England's so-called victory in the cricket so-called World Cup. Like many genuine cricket lovers, I was dismayed by the scenes of jubilant players embracing each other in their multicolored pajamas, <laughs> while the crowd behind celebrated in a vulgar fashion. <laughs> Such was the poor quality of the cricket cricket that both teams lost several wickets and scored way more than the traditional 50 runs per day <laughs> without loss. What has the world come to when a devotee of leather on willow cannot visit lords safe in the knowledge that his quiet afternoon slumber <laughs> will be uninterrupted? Now, the unfortunate spectator has to endure the almost incessant action on the field of play, making it almost impossible to focus on the Daily Telegraph crossword. <laughs> the unseemly enjoyment of an overexcited, beer-soaked rabble <laughs> who seem hell-bent on having what they would call a good time. 
<laughs> entirely ruins the day for those of a more traditional bent, armed only with a thermos flask of cold tea and a Tupperware box of egg sandwiches <laughs> made by their good lady wives. <laughs> now, one risks being struck by a shockingly miscolored white ball raining down from the heavens and Long endangering down. life and limb. If it was excitement was I was after, oh, I've got a cut. Yep. I can only hope... <laughs> I can only hope the forthcoming Ashes series <laughs> will see the noble game return to its former glory. <laughs> <laughs> Endless days of meandering nothingness, reaching an agreeable conclusion where the match being abandoned due to rain. That is what English summers are all about. And that, sir, is cricket. Good night. Yay! <laughs> yeah, summer like we come in on time. Ho, ho, ho. Brilliant. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. We have to hurry at the end. They've got a proper yeah. play on. Uh, play on. <laughs> they've got Brian Friel's translations, which is uh, meant to be very good, but they do, do want us off about a quarter of an hour ago. So um, <laughs> thank you very much for indulging us. We will be signing books. Most of this material um, uh, appears in the annual. If you want to read it again yourself... Uh, better. <laughs> uh, it's um, entirely up to you. But could I say I am fantastically grateful, particularly at this time, for the presence of this amazing cast. They've got plenty else to do, and they turned up tonight. Brilliant, Harry.